now, who he is known to some of you. Uh, Felix and Jessica worked with him with some power to change work in the past as well. And John is part of how I got to know John was through the Jesus Collective uh, Partner Hub that are uh, in a pastor group together. And for those of you that are new to Pilgrim, we try to schedule a guest at least once a month and or someone from in-house, our in-house teaching team as well. And then I usually teach three Sundays and everyone appreciates a break from me. So, um, and, uh, but John has been in ministry for some years. And uh, this Sunday was interesting because I actually was with John and another group of pastors at a summit in, uh, in Toronto. And, and uh, I got my, my wife and some others harassed me about this saying, so wait a second, you're going on a conference in Toronto and to have a break, you're inviting someone who's also been going to the same conference. And I just want to clarify that John picked this date and we'd been bantering back and forth for some time. So this is all on him about this date. So... But I've had the pleasure of hearing John uh, share in our cluster and also uh, larger gatherings about different aspects of being the church and sort of this contested time that we live in in post-Christendom. And uh, yeah, he has a a great teaching gift and preaching as well. And so I'm excited for John, and I'm sure he'll add anything else about his family or whatever about who he is. Um, But let's give John a warm welcome this morning as he comes up to bring us the word today. Thank you, John. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. And uh, I never know how to introduce myself, so that's great. Someone else could introduce me. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I've worked with Power to Change. I've lived in Vancouver for about 15 years, and uh, I live with my family in Strathcona. I have three kids, twins that are 11 and a daughter that's nine. And I pastor a church called Reality Vancouver, which is just down the street here. We are at like, Kingsway and Fraser. We have a building that we rent over there, but it's got flooded in September, and so there's still construction happening, but we're meeting over, uh, if you guys know the St. John's Shaughnessy building, the old St. John's Shaughnessy building on Granville and uh, King Ed, that's where we're meeting now. So they're going on over there, at, uh, and, and I like this place, because you guys start at 1030. I'm like both an introvert and not a morning person, so my <laughs> ultimate day is not to talk to anyone before 1030 in the morning, so <laughs> y'all start at 1030, that's great. Um, so, so our church, similarly to, to Pilgrim, we're, we're walking on this journey through becoming a Jesus-centered church. And I know you guys are starting a series on that. I think you talked a little bit about it last week. We're, we're starting the same, and next week I'll, I'll start preaching on the book of Galatians and talking about how Jesus invites us to be centered on him. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, I know you guys are, may, that language may be kind of new to you. The centered church uh, idea or being centered on Jesus is, is a different way of envisioning what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So it's juxtaposed or the opposite of a bounded set. So if you think of a big circle with Jesus at the middle, that's a bounded set. And that circle represents different ideas, different theological beliefs, different practices that we're trying to get people in or out. So maybe it's like, I prayed a prayer once, therefore I'm in. Or I do a certain set of activities. Or more importantly for Christians, it's don't do a certain set of things anymore. right? I, we were at this conference and someone said, I don't drink, smoke, or chew or go with people who do. That was like kind of their thing growing up that they heard. It, those are the people who are outside. Us Christians, we're inside. We do these types of things. Or maybe, like I said, it's a, it's a kind of belief system that you have. Certain beliefs about Jesus, a systematic set of, of who Jesus is or who God is. So that's one way of looking at church and looking at what it means to follow Jesus. The centered set idea is different. It puts Jesus at the middle, and it asks not a a bounded set question, are you in or out, but it asks about the direction. Which way are you going? So if you imagine arrows from different people, it asks, is your arrow pointed towards Jesus, or is it pointed away from him? So you might be someone who came today with a friend. They've just been bugging you for a long time or something like that, and you finally are like, okay, whatever. I'm just going to come show up today. Or I have loads and loads of doubts, but I'm going to show up today to this group of people and open myself up to what I hear said. So you might be very, very distant from Jesus, but your arrow is pointed towards. So first of all, thanks for being here. That's awesome. I hope you stick around and you get to know some of the people here. But that, that's the idea, is your arrow is pointed towards. That's the most important thing, the direction. On the other hand, you might be very close, considered close to Jesus. Like you might be a pastor or an elder, or you might be like the holiest of holy people in this community, like Shell, you know? Or I stayed with Shell for five days in a hotel, so probably I think the most holy person in this community is probably Shell's wife. She's probably filled with the spirit of kindness, gentleness, patience. Um, But it's like, even if you're a pastor, maybe you're considered very close to Jesus. But if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, your arrow is pointed away. You're more concerned with the NBA playoffs or your mortgage or something like that, as good as those things are. 
that's you're moving away from Jesus. And so we're more concerned with the direction of which way you're going than the boundaries. And, um, and, and so the way I describe it to my community is it's not that boundaries stop happening. It's not that the things that we believe or the things that we do are unimportant. It's a question of we take the boundaries here and we just sunset them a little bit and we bring the question of direction forward. We ask, which way are you headed in your faith? Are you saying yes to whatever God has in front of you today? And so that's a bit about the, the centered set. Now, today, I want to talk specifically about this Jesus that we have at the center. Let's take a closer look at him, because if we kind of take out some of these boundaries and we bring, we ask people to bring uh, one of the, my favorite pictures of what it means to be centered set is that we ask different people, different, you know, Shell today talked about women and mothers. We ask women to bring their gifts and men. We ask people from different ethnic backgrounds. You know, you seem like a diverse group of people. We ask you to bring your gifts to the table and center on Jesus. But we need to ultimately be really clear about who this Jesus is that we have at the center. And so I want to take a look at that today with you, at who Jesus is. And we're going to go back a couple weeks to the Easter story and look at two responses that people have to the risen Jesus. So I invite you to read with me this morning from Matthew 28. I'm just going to read it out for us and focus on the two people who meet uh, the risen Jesus, so the two people who are in front of the empty tomb and their different responses to Jesus. So Matthew 28, verses 1 to 9. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. It would be tough to just be like the other Mary. As a person with a really generic white bread name like John, you're like, oh, you're the other John? Um, <laughs> I I am deep empathy for the other Mary. There was a violent earthquake. Sorry, I'm sorry. We'll continue on. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. And the angel told the women, do not be afraid because I know you're looking for, for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he is risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples he has risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So departing quickly from the tomb and with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then Jesus met them and said, greetings. They came up, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. This is God's word. So in this passage, we see two people, right? We see two groups of people. We see these guards and we see the women and they have very different reactions to this empty tomb. So here's what it says about the guards. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. The women, on the other hand, departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and they ran to tell the disciples the news. Now key to note, a whole other sermon here could be that you see that both of them actually experienced, they had fear. Fear doesn't stop us from following Jesus. Fear and doubt, these aren't things we need to be afraid of. But one of them, the guards, move towards death. They become like zombies. But the women are actually mobilized, and they run and tell people the good news. So why these different reactions to the tomb? And what does this say about the resurrection? And then what does it say for us about following Jesus? So let's look more closely at both characters. Let's look first at the guards. Now, one of the things I want to say, it's very obvious, but these are soldiers, So these aren't wimps, okay? And I think I say this because when we look back at this story, we do two things. The first is we look down our nose at these people. 2,000 years ago, we kind of think, ah, these guys, you know, they were like Cro-Magnum men or something like that. They didn't really know what was going on. Uh, C.S. Lewis calls that chronological snobbery. We look down our nose at people who don't live in this moment in time, and we think, oh, we've got science, we've got all these other things. But I encourage you to just enter into the story and hear what Matthew is saying to us. These guards, they're soldiers, They're the strongest of the strong at that time. They're powerful people. And also the second thing is that we've heard this story so many times, like the Christmas narrative. We've heard the passion story so many times that we kind of, we know we're not supposed to like the guards. We know we're not really supposed to respect the guards. Like if we were doing a play about this and I asked you like, who do you resonate with most in this story? No one would be like the guards. I, I like the guards. I also like to use my power just to subject people. So I really resonate. Like, we all know we're not supposed to like the guards. And so we don't take them seriously. But these guys aren't wimps. They're probably not people who, you know, like, like some of us may, like, faint at the sight of blood. These are strong, strong men. And on top of that, they're trained to deal with these types of situations. Now, I know they're not American soldiers, but I tried to work as much American material in for Shell into this sermon. 
because I know he'll appreciate it. So the U.S. Army has a term that they've coined for situations like this that they train their soldiers for. It's called VUCA. VUCA, it's an acronym. It means volatile situations, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That's what they train their soldiers for, is to walk into situations that you and I would just be like, what in the world is going on? They train their soldiers to walk into those situations and take control. That's probably what these folks are prepared for, these soldiers. And how do they deal with VUCA situations? What do they do? Do they walk in and they're like, you know what, this situation is crazy. Let's give everybody a vote. No. That's not a yes. No. Are they like, you know what, uh, history is here, our other soldier, he brought a whole bunch of jambes. So let's just get in a circle. Let's just drum it out, you know, drum out the bad juju, and then we'll just move on ahead. No. He, they deal with it in one way and one way only. They deal with it with power. That's the only way that they've been trained to deal with these types of situations. They come into VUCA situations, they're powerful people, and they deal with it with power. And they've been unbelievably successful. Okay? The power has conquered the known world. They're the most powerful army at the time. Yet what happens to these soldiers in front of the empty tomb? It says they were shaken by fear. Now, the, the root word here in Greek is a word that we still use today. I'm not as smart as Shell, so I also had to throw a few of these in because I know you guys probably talk about Greek here a lot. But this word is one we can all get. It's the word seismic. We still use that word today. They used it earlier in this passage, if you notice, to describe the earthquake. That's what's going on inside these guys. There's a personal earthquake in front of the empty tomb. It's shaken by fear, they become like dead men. Matthew is trying to tell us that these guys who are the, the most powerful people, like physically powerful people who are trained to deal with the situation, they have a personal earthquake and they become like zombies in front of the empty tomb. They're frozen and immobilized. Now let's take a look at the second characters here, the women. In that culture, the women occupied a very different social space than the guards. The guards were up here. They were powerful. They were strong. The women were on the other end of the spectrum. They were considered in that time, rather than being stable and strong and powerful like the soldiers, they were like emotional and flighty and unreliable. So if these two women, Mary Magdalene and other Mary, if they had witnessed a crime on the way to the tomb, they couldn't testify in court. It's as if the crime never happened because they were untrusted people in that time. And so uh, the social expectations for the women at the tomb I, I like to think of it like this. If you guys have ever seen like an old black and white horror movie where like, you know, the creature from the Blue Lagoon or whatever pops up and there's a woman there and then she's like, oh, and you know, she puts her hand over her head like this and then she's like, oh, the vipers or whatever. I don't know what people say. But that's kind of what we're supposed to be and then she just faints. That's, that's the social expectation of the women at the tomb. I'm not saying that's the way we should look at women. I'm going to be really clear. I think this is recorded. That's not the way we should think of women. That is just the social expectation at the time. What do we see happening here? Departing quickly from the tomb with fear. Matthew writes, honestly, these are people, they're afraid. They've never experienced anything like this before. But in great joy, they run to tell the disciples the good news. The complete opposite reaction of the soldiers. Rather than being frozen with fear, they're mobilized into action. So what's going on here? I'm going to read from a, a commentator that I found really helpful, Stanley Hauerwas. This is what he says. The reactions in this passage indicate the transformation that Jesus' resurrection has affected. The resurrection of Jesus is a seismic event. That's what he's trying to tell us. The empty tomb is a transformational moment in history. It's an offer, offer for a transformational moment for each of our lives, for these women and the guards at the tomb. It changes absolutely everything. Hauerwas continues, those who thought they were alive now discover that what they took for life is death. Those who had thought they were alive now discover that what they took for life is death. The life of the Roman guards was the sword, was their power the ability to use and wield power. And that power, so that was their vision of what they thought life was. And that was backed. Their, their power in front of guarding that grave was backed by the whole Roman uh, military complex, which was backed by Caesar himself, the most powerful person in the world at that time. They thought he was like a god. He was the emperor of the world. And yet that power, the greatest power in the world at the time, is shown to be absolutely nothing in front of the empty grave. 
because the power needed to raise someone from the dead is greater. And so the soldiers are transformed. Rather than being powerful people, they become like zombies. Rather than having life, they become dead. And the women are transformed in the exact opposite way. The women, low in culture, look down on unreliable women in front of the empty tomb, gain life. I love this passage and and how it lays it out. That the angel, he sees these women. He speaks to them. You know, in that culture, rabbis wouldn't even speak to their wives in public. The angel sees them. He speaks to them and he sends them. There's a whole other sermon outline for you, Shell. Three S's in a row. That's even ready to go. He sees them. He speaks to them. He sends them with the greatest news of all time. Jesus is alive. Could he be alive? A complete reversal of the power structures. And if you've been following along in the Gospel of Matthew, if you're familiar with it, you'll know that this has been a theme that Matthew's been talking about the whole time. Who, according to Matthew, are the blessed in our world? Is it the people with university degrees? Especially if you went to UBC and not SFU. Is that who are ble- is blessed? Sorry, that's a little shade. That's an inside Vancouver joke, too. So it's, but, like, is that who it is? Is, is? Does Jesus say, blessed art thou if thou didst invest in Bitcoin early? No. The Beatitudes, blessed are you if you are poor. Blessed are you if you're weak, if you're powerless. Who does Jesus invite to be his disciples? Who does Rabbi Jesus say, come and follow me? Is it the people who are in great control of their lives? Is it the people who have the opportunity to really take this Jesus thing and take it to the next level? Start a podcast? You know how Jesus helped me and I can help you in your business too? Is that who Jesus is looking for? No, Matthew 11, you know who he says? He says, come to me. All you who are, what? Weary and burdened. What's going on? And who does he say will inherit the kingdom? Is it people with power? Is it people with swords? People who have it together? No, he says children. Children were below women in that culture. They were nothing. So why? Why would Jesus call these people blessed? Why would he invite them? Why would he, why would the women be raised and the guards be put low? Well, I tend to think in diagrams, so here's one for you. I hope this will help take it out of my head and and hopefully what Matthew is doing and help you understand a little bit. So the hope storylines of all of our lives kind of go like this. We have this vision of what we want, the good life. And this, uh, the first century was no different. They had a clear social ladder, how you kind of went up and to the right. And it's an honor-shame culture, which probably many of us from coming from different cultures are quite familiar with. That was the society that they have. And if you have more interest in learning about that, there's a great Bible project video that you can look up on YouTube that talks about what this social uh, ladder looked like. And in this society, the guards, as we've seen, have had way more power. They were way higher on the social ladder than the women. And so when Jesus comes into the world and people are like, oh, you might be the Messiah. You might be this new emperor. They try to push him up the top. They try to push him towards this vision of good life and the the power positions in the world. And they think what will happen is if we get Jesus up there, we get him into this position of power, then there will be this crazy clash with Rome and Jesus will come out victorious and, and our people and our story will be the winning story in the world. And Jesus comes and he says, yeah, rightfully, I am the king of the world. He doesn't pull back when people say he's the Messiah. But he says, also, I'm a servant. I come to serve. I come to be rejected, actually. In that passage from Matthew 11, how he talks about himself, he says, I'm humble and lowly. That's the heart of who I am. And then he dies. And he doesn't die this, like, beautiful, amazing death. You know, if you guys have ever watched the movie Braveheart, There's this end where he's killed and it's kind of humiliating, but at the end he like throws up his hand and he's like, freedom. It's Mel Gibson with a really bad Scottish accent. But that's like kind of sometimes I think what we think of when we think of Jesus. No, Jesus dies naked on a cross, alone, humiliated, absolutely humiliated. And so what happens to the disciples and everybody following him? They take off. They go back to work. They're like, we lost. Like Jesus didn't ascend. Like we lost. It's over. But then something really strange happens. Jesus doesn't stay dead. And there's an empty tomb. And he appears to these two women. And then he appears to the disciples. And then it says in Corinthians, he appears to a few hundred people. And 
at the moment of his resurrection, he's changing the whole story. He's offering us a new vision. The Bible uses this word, it calls it apocalypse. It's a revealing of the way that things are and a transformation of everything that's in the world. And he's saying that what looked like life before in our world, all the, all the cultures of the world, power, honor, standing, and moving towards the good life, those things are not life at all, but they're death. And those of us who have very little of the good life, those of us who have been humiliated, who are lower on the standing there, like the women were, now have the opportunity to receive honor and glorification by following our king. But the path is through the cross, out through the grave, into a completely different world, a different kingdom where the crucified savior reigns and rules, where we are invited to be made into new human beings and the kingdom where the first are last and the last will become first. It's a very different vision of what it means to be human and what it means to be part of a kingdom. Now, why? Why, why would Jesus do the, this way? I think it's because God knows that what we need is not like a little rocket booster for our lives. Like our lives are headed up into the, uh, to the right here. And so we bring Jesus in just to give us a little bit of nitrous, just to push us ahead slightly. Like what we don't need, according to the Gospels, is like a little bit of Jesus Red Bull just to get us a little more excited, to become a little bit more efficient, to be slightly better versions of ourself. What we need in the language of the Gospels is something different altogether. We need to be transformed. We need to be remade. The Gospel of John says we need to be reborn. We need to die and rise again to be made into new human beings. That is the offer of Jesus. That is what he thinks we need. And so he moves into death itself. He rises and he comes out the other side, offering us a completely new vision of the world. He rips open the world. He rejects this whole right side of the graph and he invites us to come. And that's why the women get it and the guards don't. It's not just because they're women, although I will say like most of the women in my life are slightly to very more intuitive than I am about most things in the world. But it's not just because they're women, but because they're lower on this right side of, of the graph. In that society, women just had a hard ceiling on how high they could go. So they're, they're lower to the Christ event. They're lower to the cross or closer to the cross. And so they might be able to receive a different vision of what the good life is. They've already lost on this game of going up and to the right. And so they have less to, to lose and they're open to a different story another vision of the world. And so what these women do is they move through fear with faith and they become free and they're mobilized by King Jesus by taking on the death and resurrection of Jesus. They become people who are reliable witnesses and they take the good news. Now, how does this relate to you and I and why does this matter if we want to be centered on Jesus? Well, I think all cultures... And all societies and all of our families, we tell a very similar story of up and to the right. There's a vision of the good life that all of us have. Maybe you got it from your family. Maybe you got it from Canadian culture. Maybe you got it from social media. Maybe you got it from advertising. Whatever makes up that thing on the right that is there for you. We all have different visions of it. And if you guys have small groups or discussion times, that would be a really good thing to talk about. What is that thing? What are those things that make up that picture of the good life for you? But our, our vision of what it means to be human and to grow is to move up and to the right, to make gains, to climb up the social ladder. Sociologists call this gaining symbolic capital in the world. And if, I'll say this. If you're from an immigrant family, and I am, my dad is from Hong Kong, this is especially true of us because our families move here to Canada to move up the ladder. That's why we move here. That's why we go, up the hard, go through the hardships of coming to a new country because it offers us a life that is attainable, accessible, available for us and for our children. And so we are very mobilized by this life. Like Drake says, the whole vi vision of, of uh, you know, immigrants is kind of, we started from the bottom, now we're here. We started from the bottom, now the whole team's here. That's, I think it's a song about immigrants. I'm not really sure. I've never met Drake. He's not returning my emails right now. But... <laughs> So, and, and as Canadians, as Canadians, so I, uh, a sociologist that I listen to, he says this, Americans want to be great. They want to be up at the very top. As Canadians, we're slightly more humble. Sorry, Shell. We're slightly more humble. We don't want to be up at the, we, we don't want to be great. We want a great life. 
What we want is not like to be the 1%. What we want to be is like upper middle class. That's right where we want to be. We just, you know, slightly more humble. We don't need the newest Beamer. We just need to be a little bit lower. And that's the vision, I think, for most of us, the great Canadian middle class dream. That's what most of our lives are going along about, is to try to get right there. And what happens is when we meet Jesus, we place him into that story and that vision of what the good life is, that Jesus helps me attain that. Jesus kind of becomes like a handrail for us. He can pull us up a little bit closer to that dream of who we are. And that's just natural. That's how we live life. That's what everything in our society is moving us towards. So it's very natural that we would take Jesus and we would put him into that story too. But here's the thing. Jesus is a pretty crappy handrail. And replace crappy with a much stronger word in your mind that I can't say while I'm you know, being recorded. And, and I'll say this. I'll just speak from my own life, that Jesus is a pretty crappy handrail. I, I've been gone for two weeks, so you know, I haven't been able to go to counseling. So you guys can just be here. This is a safe space, right? I'll just open and share my garbage with all of you. Okay, so I've been following Jesus closely, I would say, for about 20 years now. He's been pretty bad at making my dreams come true. I was going to be super honest with you. It's been pretty bad at making my middle-class dreams come true or even my, my 1% dreams come true. You know, I, I hoped I would be playing in the NBA by now or at least maybe retired at my age in the NBA right now. And me and Felix would be playing in the NBA. I don't know what your dream is. Maybe be a statistician in the NBA. I don't know what your dream was, Felix. I don't want to put that on you. But I'm not. Instead, I'm here with you guys living in Vancouver, hustling along with everybody else. And here's what I realized. Like, Much of my life, whether it's that or it's just other things that are like much, much simpler, a middle class dream, that I've been been facing the wrong way. I've been facing up here and I've been inviting for most of my life God to come along with me. Hey, help me out. Help me out towards this vision of a middle class life. And like I said, none of the things other than the MBA thing, like none of the things that I really want are like crazy things. They're just normal things that everybody seems to have. But I realize I've been facing the wrong way with Jesus. I've been trying to gain social capital and make my vision of the good life come true. And one of the places I find this most is in my prayer life. How I pray and what my heart goes towards is this vision of the good life. And so I pray, Jesus, help help me with this. And that's one thing for you. You know, this might be a little too obtuse or meta for you. What does your prayer life say? What are you asking God to do? in your life. Or another way of saying it, someone once said, your religion is what you do with your solitude. Where does your mind go when you have nothing else to think about? When it's just wandering? What are the hopes and dreams that take place that make the good life up? And you're probably inviting Jesus to come along. Again, this is no shame time. I'm just saying this is natural for us as Canadians and as people in the world. And so I've prayed those prayers. God, help me get this job. Help me do well. Help me get better. But when I pray this way, I I found in my life that God is mostly silent and he feels pretty distant. My relationship with him kind of gets a little bit cold. And here's what I've come to see. It's not because God is silent or he's far away. He's speaking, but he's always just speaking from the bottom. His hand is always coming from that place. You know, we just prayed earlier this prayer, which was great. Thanks for leading us in that. We continue to look to you to see your hand at work. We prayed that. We continue to look to you to see your hand at work. And my vision was always that God's hand would be pulling me up. Give me a little rocket booster. Help me out. But what I've realized is that God's voice in his hand is always pulling me the other way. He's pulling me down. And if I learn to listen to that, I actually hear his voice. And it's not that my middle class dreams are bad. They're just too small. They're too small for the God of the universe. You know, Jesus didn't have to die so my kids could have a backyard. He could have just made that happen, like, boom, or I don't know, however he does it. I don't really know how he does it. He didn't need to die for that to happen. And so my dreams are too small. He doesn't seem that interested in fulfilling my skull-sized kingdoms, and it, my kingdom dreams. And it's not because he hates me or the things that I'm praying about are inherently bad, but he has a different vision for me and for you. He wants me to become a new human being. He wants us to look like Jesus, me, someone from nowhere, nobody. He actually wants me to look like his son. That's his vision, and that's where he's always inviting me. And here's the really good news. When I learn to say yes to that story, when I learn to see that hand at work in my life, I meet 
Jesus. Again, I don't know you guys, so I'm just sharing from my own life. Like I said, I haven't been in counseling in two weeks, so I just share some stuff with you. So two years ago, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. Praise God, I am now, uh, as far as they know, there's no cancer in my body. In my 30s, I get colon cancer. It was, it was a really tough week. On Tuesday, I found out I, w- I had colon cancer. On Friday, the world shut down because of coronavirus. So it was like a tough week for me. And, you know, I'm going through all the emotions of it. Sad, angry, frustrated, uh, don't know what to feel. And, and of course, my family is there with, with me too, and they're going through all their emotions. And then the doctors are kind of telling you, they have to tell you like kind of worse. They're like, it's probably going to be okay, but then they tell you all the worst case scenario of things that could happen. So you're dealing with all that as well. And it was frustrating, and it was really, really hard. So I, I started chemo basically a week later. And um, I'm, I'm going to God with all this stuff, anger, frustration. Again, like we're, we're welcome to come to Jesus with this stuff. He wants, he wants us to come with it. But I'm reading through my, uh, the Bible in a year, just as I usually do. And I'm in the book of Habakkuk, as we all are, right? We just read Habakkuk on a whim. You know, you know how, as you do, as you do. And I read this passage from Habakkuk 3. I want to share it with you. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there's no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the field produces no food, though the flocks disappear from the pen and there are no herds in the stall, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. And this passage just destroyed me. Even now when I read it, I I get pretty emotional because I felt that way like the rug was being pulled out from under me and I don't know what it feels like to have no flocks in the stalls but there felt like there was no flocks in the stalls and I asked myself the question can I celebrate can I rejoice and for part of the time I, I had to say no but I took a different stance after that and the thing I, I realized God was pulling me this way he was pulling me down on that graph I w- my prayers were like, heal me. Like, think about how amazing that would be. We could get it on the Vancouver Sun, Van City Buzz, front page, pastor healed, nobody knows why, prayer is the answer. Like, doesn't that sound good? Wouldn't that make our lives a lot easier? But God's invitation was not that story. And I'm so thankful for my medical team. They did miraculous, and I see the hand of God in there. But God was pulling me this way. He was pulling me down. So every day I would go to chemo or radiation. I would take my chemo pills and go to radiation. And radiation is a bit of a a humiliating thing. You take your clothes off in front of all these strangers. And you lie on this radiation table. And what I started to do is start to pray Psalm 23 every day. God is my shepherd. I won't be wanting. He puts a table out there. He invites me to a meal even when I feel like I'm surrounded by enemies. He leads me by still waters. And that place, that radiation table, became a place of worship. Jesus met me there. It's not how if I could choose, oh, I tell you, me and my family and all the people praying for me, they would send God the other way, heal me miraculously. He chose not to do that, but he showed up in that moment. And I met Jesus. And I'll say this. I don't, again, I don't know you all, but I bet there are some people here right now who you desperately want to know Jesus. Your life with him is pretty cold. It feels like he's pretty distant. And I just, I, I, I believe with all of my heart, no matter what you're going through, that God is at work. But if you're only seeing his hand pull you up, you might be missing what he's trying to do and what he's trying to say and how he wants to meet you. I love what happens with these women. It says, So departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, they ran to tell the disciples the news. They receive this good news about Jesus. They're transformed. They say yes to him. And then it says, then they met Jesus. They met Jesus and he said, greetings. The Greek here says that this is just like a a really colloquial saying. It's like Jesus showed up on the road and he's like, oh, hey, hey. Or if like where I come from, they say, oh, how you now? How you doing? That's what Jesus says. He just shows up in their everyday life and says, hey, and you know what happens? They worshiped. They fell at his feet and they worshiped. That close ties with him. If that's what you're looking for, look for the hand of Jesus. Look for the greeting of Jesus, not in the pulling up, but in the invitation to the cross to die and rise again as new people. 
The resurrection has transformed everything. That's what this story is all about. And it's the resurrected Jesus who stands at the center of our lives and our communities. He's the one who's reaching back to each of us, to each of our lives, not with the hand to pull you up, not with a manicured hand of, you know, golden bearded Jesus pulling you up into your dreams, but the nail pierced hands of Jesus inviting us down into this dying and rising event. And unless we have that resurrected Jesus at the center of our lives and our churches, we'll never be a community that's centered on Jesus because our middle-class dreams will just take over. And at some point, you'll be like, you know, the kids' program here, I think we need a better one. We're going to go find a better church. Or Shell, you know, his preaching used to be so funny. I don't really know if you're a funny preacher. Probably not. It used to have so many facts, so many history facts, and I loved it, and now there's not so many facts anymore. Ah, probably going to go to another place. Or this place, there's like 40 of us. I'm going to go to a place that feels like it's really booming, that makes me feel really like part of something. And the church, when it stops meeting our middle class dreams, will leave. Jesus offers us a different Vision. I love the song that we sang, He Shall Reign. What does it mean that 50 people gathered on a Sunday singing He Shall Reign? On this side, on the up and to the right uh, curve, it means nothing. And maybe some of you feel like that. Why are we here singing? But if we've been through the death and resurrection and we're standing with the risen and reigning Jesus, singing He Shall Reign means everything. Because we join a chorus of people not only around this city, but all throughout history, who witness to the resurrected Jesus, who won't be pulled up and to the right, but invites us to a completely different way of living. And here's the last thing I'll say. Unless we have this resurrected Jesus at the center of our lives and our churches, we'll never have anything to offer our friends, our families, our neighbors. Because all we'll be offering is Jesus as a handrail. Jesus can help you out with your middle class dreams. And like I said, he's bad at it. And our neighbors see through it. There's better opportunities to help them out with their middle-class dreams. Just get a better financial manager. <laughs> Honestly, just, you know, my, my friends would be like, ah, you know what, Jesus is, sounds boring. I'm going to try psilocybin. That's better, way better. You show up my house Friday, 8 p.m., it's going to happen. It's going down. Where's this nebulous Jesus? When's he showing up? I don't know. Unless we see this died and resurrected Jesus, unless we live that story, we'll never have anything to say because Jesus is a bad handrail. It's only when we accept that invitation for us as individuals and as communities to die and to rise again that we'll have a different vision of life, a different kingdom, and we can say to them, he is reigning and he shall reign. Stanley Hauerwas quotes to finish. Let's finish with this quote. Jesus' resurrection creates a life freed from the death that grips our everyday lives. This is life reborn. Revealing to us how death has determined our living. And yet, it's possible to remain dead, to live as dead men, and the behavior, as the behavior of these guards makes clear. Where are you at? Are you more like these guards, living as dead people? Is Jesus just a handrail in your life? Or have you been reborn? Are you standing in the shoes of these wonderful women who accept the invitation of the risen Jesus to a new kingdom and a new way of living? Let me pray for us as we close. God, we thank you for this amazing story. And most of all, we thank you for the resurrection, for your death and resurrection, and that you are right now reigning and ruling. So I pray for each of us who find ourselves in different places of our lives with different visions of the good life that have been shaped by all sorts of things. And I just ask that we would see your hand and hear your voice calling us to die and rise again. Not because you hate us, not because our dreams are even bad, but just because you long for us actually to become new people. You want us to look like you, both as individuals and as a church. So I pray that over this group of people. I pray that over my life and my family and my church too. May we become new people. May we become in just some minuscule way something that resembles you. And and I pray that that would not only witness to each other, 
that you are reigning, but that would witness to our society and to our friends and to my family and to our neighbors that you are king and that there's a different way of living life. So as we worship together, as we take communion, may you transform us. May you remind us of these truths. And I pray this blessing over Pilgrim Church and this community and the leadership and everybody here. May we be a group of people who just accept your invitation to die and rise again. In Christ's name we pray, amen.